Well, I'd like to welcome everybody here this evening. If you could join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item 1.03 is approval of the agenda. Move to approve the agenda as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Chair votes aye and the agenda passes. Item 1.04 is recognition of the Elko County School District Spelling Bee top finishers. <clears throat> we can uh, get Matt to announce their names and we'll hand out the what we did last time. I apologize. Not try to well, cheat and spell it. So. <laughs> Ariana Anderson. Did I pronounce that correctly? She is the fifth grade spelling bee champion. You want them to like stand somewhere? Yeah. Okay. So Ariana, go right over to that side over there and just stand over there for a minute. Alonzo Para. I hope I pronounced that right. Alonzo was the Fifth grade spelling bee runner up. Sixth grade spelling bee champion is Sage Cumber Cartwright. Sixth, bee spelling, or sixth grade spelling bee runner up is Cade Fender. Seventh grade spelling bee champion is Braxton Peterson. Uh, all right can everybody hear me a little better there all right seventh grade spelling bee runner up is gracie smith the eighth grade spelling bee champion is lydia slade And the eighth grade spelling bee runner up is Carson Ballard. The 2021 Elko County School District spelling bee overall champion is Lydia Slade. And the 2021 Elko County School District Spelling Bee overall runner-up is Ariana Anderson. So uh, just a couple words while, so Cassie's gonna get some pictures of our, our kiddos there. Um, just to give everyone a little bit of background on how how kids made it to this point at every school in the district where we have students grades five through eight, uh, unless I'm mistaken and it takes place differently at each campus, I think they follow the same process where every class at, so every fifth grade class all around the district, they would determine a individual classroom champion. Then that classroom champion, if there were more, if there was more than one class of the same grade at that school, they would then have a face off for school champions and then uh, three up to three kids from every school for every grade level were eligible to participate in the district spelling bee. Um, and so uh, by that 60 kids qualified, we had, I don't know if, I don't think we had full 60, but we had a lot at the, at the, the district spelling bee on Saturday and kids did awesome. Um, they had a lot of words that uh, and I know at some point I was looking sideways at some adults and we were all just shrugging our shoulders. I don't know how to spell that one either. Um, so they, they did a pretty amazing job and we're all real proud of, of these students and especially the, 
the courage it takes to get up on a stage and, and, and do that in front of everybody. Real, real impressed. So just wanted to give you a little bit of background on how that, how we got to that point and just another congratulations from all of us. Really impressive. Well done. Item 1.05 is E-Rate Consulting Presentation by Eric Flock. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Eric Flock. And first off, can you hear me okay? Yep. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to speak in front of uh, you all. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Mac and uh, his predecessor, uh, Dwayne, since uh, about 2018. Uh, so we've become uh, very intimate with the district and uh, about to tell you about E-Rate and what E-Rate is. Uh, feel free to ask any questions in real time. You don't, don't need to hold it um, till the end. Uh, but for starters, uh, my name is Eric Flock and I'm with a company called E-Rate Central. Uh, E-Rate Central has been working with this program since the start of it uh, in 1998. And uh, I personally have 20 years of E-Rate experience, so I'm pretty much a one-trick pony, and E-Rate is that trick. Uh, I spent uh, 10 years as part of the senior leadership team at USAC, which is the administrator of the E-Rate program, so I worked for the nonprofit in D.C., and I found that it was time for me to move on and to be able to handhold districts um, through the complex E-Rate program to take advantage uh, of, the, of the funding. So going to exactly what is E-Rate, uh, E-Rate is one of the largest funds uh, that helps pay for technology, uh, specifically internet access, wide area network connectivity, and it's funded by something called the Universal Service Fund. Uh, everyone in this room should be familiar with this in one way or the other. If you, pay, if you have a cell phone bill, there's a like $5 fee or $10 fee at the end, that's the Universal Service Fund. That money gets pooled together every year and about $4 billion is allocated to schools every year to help pay for telecommunications and internet access and some networking gear. Uh, and we'll talk about those in just a few minutes. Uh, the FCC is in charge of this program and it's run by the nonprofit administrator uh, acronym is called USAC, the Universal Service Administrative Company. And since the start of the program, $49 billion has been approved uh, for schools and libraries around the nation and including our territories. So what is E-Rate? Uh, E-Rate provides discounts and it's on uh, internet access, wide area networks and, and hardware. And it ranges anywhere from 20% uh, to 90%. People use this as a way to, uh, the FCC requires a formal competitive bidding uh, scenario. So that way every, every vendor has an opportunity to bid on the, op uh, on the services. And it's a reimbursement program based on actual expenditures. So what this isn't, this is not a grant program. This is not a loan program. And uh, this is not a one-time application process. This is something that we're gonna be going uh, through year after year after year to make sure that uh, all your facilities have the internet that you need and for the students to need to be able to uh, perform at their peak without having computers or the network slow down their education and slow down their learning. So the discounts range anywhere from 20% uh, to 90%. And it's based off of the National School Lunch Program eligibility. So specifically for uh, Elko County, uh, we're eligible for a 70% discount on services. So on a, just on, in a very, very simple explanation, it would be on a $1,000 um, internet bill, the fund will pay $700 in E-rate or sorry, the E-rate will pay $700 and out of pocket, you would be paying $300. So it's a really great discount to help save money on monthly recurring bills, as well as one-time charges. And we'll talk about uh, one-time charges and special construction in just a few slides. And that's one place where uh, the district has exceptionally excelled. Uh, just so you're aware, and this goes back to uh, what Mac was talking about last week. Uh, there's an E-rate funding cycle, and we're not going to go through into all, everything here on the slide, but just to give you a broad picture, right now we're in the competitive bidding phase. Uh, we have an active solicitation, an RFP, 
to bid out eight of the rural schools um, in, in Elko County. And that's going on right now. And we'll be uh, awaiting bids um, later, uh, later next month. Uh, so you will um, next month be able to uh, vote on whether or not to move forward uh, with the projects and whatever vendor or vendors are selected as part of this competitive bidding process. Uh, in March, we're going to be applying for the money to USAC. So we'll tell USAC, here, are our, here is our chosen vendor or vendors, and here's how much uh, it's going to cost to connect all of our schools, and here are the monthly recurring charges. We let USAC know that service has started, and then we're able to invoice USAC uh, for the amount that they're able to fund. In terms of what's eligible, uh, it starts with least lit fiber, least dark fiber and self-provision networks. Predominantly at, at the district here, we're looking at dark fiber or least lit fiber. Um, unfortunately, we still have uh, several sites that are on fixed wireless broadband or microwave. Uh, so right now, uh, you know, at last meeting, you were talking about, you know, how old are the antennas and the microwave dishes? So they're really uh, past end of life. And this is not a solution that we're trying to solve with the current RFP that's in process. And then also some cellular data plans can be eligible, but those are more for libraries and, and bookmobiles. In terms of something called category two, that helps the internal networking. So access points, routers, anything that a student's gonna need to be able to connect to the internet and to get online and to get to any of your online learning systems. There is a five-year budget and we're in the middle of that cycle right now and the district has $1.6 million available uh, to be um, utilized through the E-Ray program. So right now we're going to be um, looking to purchase access points in the upcoming year uh, to, as part of that $1.6 million budget. Now, most importantly, and one of the things that Elko County has truly, truly taken full advantage of is what's called the state matching fund. And that's thanks to the Nevada Connect Kids Initiative uh, run by the Governor's Office of Science, Innovation, Technology, um, initially uh, created during uh, Governor uh, Sandoval's office. So the Connect Kid Initiative was uh, established to help pay for special construction. And what we mean by special construction is any of the digging, any of the trenching, any of the laying down of fiber and conduit that's needed to get fiber to, uh, to a school. And the reason why this fund was created was because the E-Ray program gave an extra incentive. And we talked about your discount of 70%. The E-Ray program is trying to encourage states to put skin in the game. And what they said was, if up to 10% is chipped in by the state, the FCC will match an additional 10%. And that's what the district here has so expertly leveraged. So instead of a 70% discount on special construction charges, you're actually getting 10% from the state and an extra 10% from the FCC, totally a 90% discount. So what happened in fun year 2017, the, the district signed a contract with a company called WANRAC and the special construction cost was $921,000. You know, that is a big, big project. With the E-rate discount of 70%, 644,000 was covered by the E-rate program. The Nevada Connect Kids Initiative paid for an additional $92,000. The FCC matched that $92,000. So the total funding obtained in, in 2017 was $828,000 to pay, help pay for that $921,000 expenditure. So for uh, $92,000 out of pocket, you've benefited from a project that was worth nearly a million dollars. And that project supported uh, Adobe, uh, Carlin, Combine, Grammar, Mountain View, Northside, Southside, and Spring Creek Middle. And that's with 10 gigabits uh, worth of fiber. In comparison, the previous service um, at these schools was 100 megs uh, per second. So you go from 100 megs uh, to 10 gigs, uh, you're looking at 100 times faster than what they were getting. Uh, so the, the exponential jump of bandwidth and being able to get high-speed internet uh, is 
it's truly astronomical um, with these sites and with this program. Now, in terms of the district participation uh, as a whole, uh, over the past five years, ERIDA has committed $2.8 million. And uh, over the life of the program, it, it's been committed $8.7 million. About 96,000 feet of fiber uh, was laid in that 2017 project that we just discussed. And then an additional 30,000 feet was added uh, when Spring Creek and Liberty Peak came online. So that was um, in 2018 or 2019. Uh, and in terms of like, I know everyone likes to measure where you are against uh, peers, uh, but uh, the only ones that are that have um, received more E-rate funding uh, over the past five years is uh, Clark County, Washoe County, and Lyon County. So Elko County um, is fourth in the in the state in terms of the amount of money that E-rate has uh, supported the district. Now, you know the 125,000 feet that equivalents to 23. Uh, miles of fiber. And that is truly, truly a wonderful thing for getting your students access to high speed connectivity. And we hope to build on that this upcoming year uh, with the eight school overall build, bid. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions that anyone may have. Question? Well, I'd like to start right off with the eight schools that we're looking at doing. Are we going to be getting these same kind of discount with the 10% match and the, you know, 90% total? Are we going to be able to, that's a great deal to me. Yeah, that, that is, that is the intent. Uh, so once we uh, see what the bids come in at, we'll be able to gauge the realisticness of USAC being able to fund these uh, sites. And uh, one of the things that I had done prior to leaving USAC uh, was establishing the special construction rules. So we were able to have a, uh, I'm able to, uh, with one of my colleagues, um, uh, we're able to gauge really well the likelihood and, and success rate of such build. Uh, so we are very much interested in seeing what vendors come into play at each of these locations to make sure that we see a cost-effective solution that hopefully will benefit not just the county, but the surrounding areas nearby because we know that in these rural areas, this is really the best opportunity uh, for the community to be able to benefit from, a, from a, any kind of infrastructure that's laid into the ground at that point in time. Mr. Chair, if I may, thank you, Mr. Flock, for the information, I appreciate that. In comparison to other districts, do we have a sufficient number or an appropriate number of service providers that respond to the RS, or I mean, the, the um, RFP? That is a really, really good question. And, and I guess this, I should say historically, because I know we're in the middle of a bid process, so I don't want to jeopardize that by any means, but I, I hope you understand the point behind the question. I do. And I, I can say that there has been a lot of interest in, the, in Elko County as a whole. Uh, when we first came into uh, working in the county back in 2017, there, uh, I would say that there weren't too many service providers uh, interested in working in the county. And over the past four years, uh, I know the governor's office has been working hard with your broadband action team um, headed by uh, Mayor Keener. And since then, there has been a lot more activity in terms of service providers wanting to enter the Elko market. And hopefully that's gonna drive competition and drive a really good rate uh, for the district. Great, thank you. Second follow-up question, or I guess a secondary question. In your presentation, you referenced library a handful of times. Is the internet provided only to the library within the school building or is it school-wide and library just being a, a term to catch those schools? Yo, sorry, um, that, that was probably, I, I could, I'll rephrase that and say the internet is going to your, uh, is going to the school, uh, but you're also benefiting from the Nevada system of higher education, uh, the ENCHI network. So you're getting a lot of internet from there, but then some of your sites, are getting internet directly from an ISP um, that aren't able to connect back to um, your central office. Thank you. My pleasure. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Flock, for the presentation. It's, it's good to see that 
some of our cell phone bill goes to a good cause. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Thank you for the opportunity. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to let me know. And uh, Mac has my full contact information. He's been wonderful to work with and has been a great advocate for your district. Well, thank you. Moving on to item 1.06, input from the public. This is a period devoted to comments by the general public, if any, and discussion of those comments. In the interest of privacy and due process, the public is requested not to raise personnel issues except in a legally notified closed personnel session of the board. Comments are limited to three minutes, three consecutive minutes. The speaker's time may not be reserved, divided, apportioned, or deferred. No action may be taken upon a matter raised under this item, the agenda until the matter itself has been included specifically on an agenda as an item upon which action will be taken. This is a non-action item. Is there any comment from the public? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to 2.01. Receipt, review, and possible approval of the Elk County School District CTE Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment for Perkins V funding. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Heather Steele and I'm the CTE facilitator for Elko County School District. What that basically means is, um, well, uh, from a facilitation standpoint, I mediate between the schools and the programs and the state and administration specifically for our current technical education programs in the district. And I'm going to apologize profusely because I'm giving you the cart before I give you the horse. The horse will be here next board meeting, but what I did not want to do is deliver all of my goods in one presentation. So um, what I've presented you with is a document which drives one of the potential um, streams of funding. I'll give you some quick history. We have 72 different career technical education programs in this district um, in all of our high schools. Um, and so Perkins 5 funding is one of those funding sources that we use to support those programs. Okay, so I'll load my presentation really quick. And the reason why I'm here with the CLNA is because for years, the Board of Trustees has been our advisory board our, and its Joint Technical Skills Committee. And one of the reasons why the board is that committee is because the advisory board used to be governed by Nevada open law, open meeting law. And so it was easier to just have everything together. The board is also a good cross section and representation of all of the communities and all of the districts. That those rules are now changing to the advisory boards are no longer subject to open meeting law, thanks to AB 38. However, as I show you the stakeholders that were responsible for this piece of do this documentation that we put together, that is also what is required for the makeup of our um, Joint Technical Skills Committee meeting. And so while some of you check some of those boxes, some of you don't get them all checked, but I'll get into that a little later. So our comprehensive local needs assessment is a document that we're required to submit every two years to the Nevada Department of Education, which shows that we look at our data and that our data drives our funding as far as our programs go, okay? So this year will drive this, well, it'll be next school year's funding and the following school year's funding. But in that two year cycle, I'll rewrite this document completely to prepare for the following two years. So this, this process is fluid and dynamic and we're always looking at our data and looking for ways to improve, okay? Um, so why do we need it? It is to ensure that our um, programs align with local workforce and economic priorities that we are serving all of our students equitably, that our CTE programs are in line with high wage, gosh, I should know this stuff by heart, high wage, high skill and in-demand occupations in either our district or our state. Um, and then it's a platform for us looking at our data 
to see and our school improvement processes to see where we can better improve our district and the lives of our students as when they're with us and then moving forward. And then we have to have that key, key, those key stakeholders involved in our process. And that's where the advisory board thing is gonna change a little bit. Okay. So the, the next part is, here's the stakeholders. This is a list of people who, when I was given it in like March or April of last year, I've had nightmares about it ever since, only because I could put every person in Elko County into one of these key stakeholders and finding the right stakeholders that are willing to really do the work with us and understand what we do. Um, and the committees have to be comprised of all of these people. And one of the beautiful things about committees is if you get too many people, it gets really hard to get any work done, realistically. So my goal was to put multiple people who could check multiple boxes so that we could continue to get work done. Um, most importantly, we have to have business and industry leaders who are telling us we're aligning appropriately and we're graduating kids that are ready to go to work. Then we have our teachers and our administrators and our counselors, um, our support staff who work with our students, um, local workforce development boards. Again, what's coming? What do we need to know? And how do we need to turn students out? Parents and students, because their voices are very important in what we do. Um, agencies and representatives of special populations, which you're going to hear extensively about here in a little bit, representing our out of school youth, our homeless youth, our youth in foster care, our at risk youth, um, families from mil with military members of the military that are serving, Indian tribes and the tribal organizations, and then any other stakeholders <laughs> that are important to us. Okay. So those, those were the stakeholders that I had to identify. And it was joked about in state meetings about where's Heather gonna find these people? <clears throat> so one of the documents I provided you with is the CLNA toolkit as a whole. It's blank and it told us and drove our process and how we were supposed to go through it. The process mimics very closely our school improvement processes that we have to go through. And so I'm familiar with that a little bit. Basically, you got to find the data and then you have to look at the data and see what kind of trends you see. And then step three is where I brought my stakeholders in. After I spent the summer and part of the fall finding all the data that we needed, then I met with stakeholders and we discussed what we saw and the trends that they saw. And then moving forward, how do we fix those trends or or encourage those trends to continue. Um, and then we prioritized some key things that we think our funding needs to be focused on for the next two years, but of course it's ongoing work. And then of course we're communicating, that's where I'm at right now, step five. And then um, we'll be responsible for evaluating if what we're doing is working over the next two years, going into the next document, if that makes sense. So the draft that you have in front of you, um, I gathered it from a wide range of sources. There's no one place to find all the answers to these questions. Um, so I gathered it at the classroom level with the actual teachers themselves. I gathered it at the school site. Infinite Campus, of course, provided me a lot of the general student data. I reached out to workforce development boards, the college, and things along those lines. We held several meetings through the fall discussing some of the questions that you saw in the CLNA toolkit that I provided you with um, to tease out our root causes and priorities. And then reviewing the draft document, we went through it, identified our priorities, and now I'm here. This document um, must be submitted to the state in its final form, even though it's a consistently and continuing moving document by the 31st of January, which is why the cart is here before the horse. <laughs> um, so there's still one more document that needs to be put together to be submitted for our Perkins application, but it hasn't been given to us yet. 
So it's still in draft form itself. So I cannot give you the entire document as it's supposed to be ready by January 31st. So we're hoping that that will come with our application for funding. Okay, so there's that part. So now I will kind of briefly, hopefully, go through and explain to you where we're at in the process now. At the end of the CLNA draft, and I will pull this up just to make it easier. If you printed it out, it's page 16 through 24. And it looks something like this. So these are, this is the document that will be the application piece for our Perkins 5 funding. And it identifies our priorities, the root causes, um, which special populations it addresses, which section, a, D, E, and F in this particular case, that's where I pulled that data to identify these key priorities. And then some measurable goals, strategies, and next step, the timeline, um, which is for this particular CLNA. But if you notice, there's some long-term, long-range goals in there. So this isn't a, after 22, we're done with this. This is, we're gonna continue evaluating and moving forward. Um, then the funding sources and then the stakeholders responsible for that. So the four, per, our Perkins, our CTE Perkins funding for a long time has always been used for professional development for our CTE teachers to attend state and national conferences specifically related to their pathway of work. Okay, so we have conferences that address national conferences that address career and technical education as a whole, but then there's teachers that go to computer science national conferences and health science national conferences. And so it's always been focused on being able to send them to, to those higher level trainings. So that's priority number one, is that we continue to offer those professional development opportunities but that we make a few changes to currently how it's offered to ensure that we are um, serving all of our CTE students equitably and giving them all access. Okay. Then the second priority is one of the big pushes for career and college ready diplomas is that students earn industry recognized credentials, which are credentials that people earn in the workforce um, that's required to go to work. So for example, in our business management programs, we're working towards students earning Microsoft Office certifications in Microsoft Word so that they can hand it to an employer and say, I know this, I'm ready to go. Um, my students and a lot of our students earn the OSHA 10 um, general industry certifications. Those are all recognized as ready to work certificates. Students who earn those industry recognized credentials also immediately earn, as long as they do all the other stuff, qualify for the career ready diploma. So one of the things with offering, being able to offer those certificates is sometimes the teachers have to be certified either trainers or testers or something along those lines. And so, Priority two is related to making sure that we have teachers that are trained and can offer those industry recognized credentials in the classroom instead of paying other people to come train our students and or test or certify our students. And some of those are very expensive. Okay. That also aligns with Nevada's um, priority to students earning career and college ready diplomas. So then, the next piece, there's a nationwide movement towards aligning um, academics in our career and tech ed programs. There is a stigma and there has been a stigma for a very long time 
that CTE students, career and tech ed students are not academic students and academic students are not CTE students. And the reality is they're all students. And the national push now is to bridge that gap. Um, one of the great things about being a CTE student is for years, the data has shown that CTE students graduate at a higher rate than non-CTE students. However, um, some of the data that we looked at, ignoring the COVID things and how it affected everything is that our CTE students are not passing the proficiencies at the rate that we would want them to. And if they're not passing the proficiencies, then that means they're not graduating when everything goes back to normal. So the third priority is to bridge that gap and bring that national priority home to Elko County. And then the fourth and fifth priorities, well, fourth priorities is last legislative session AB 38 passed, which changes a lot of the way that we do business. The NAC is not yet written, but it's going to change the way that we do business. One of the ways that it's going to do it is we need to focus on providing work-based learning opportunities for our students. And that's not just career and tech students, that's all students. Um, work-based learning used to be siloed to career and tech ed students, and it's not that way anymore. Um, so, and then we have to rebuild our Joint Technical Skills Advisory Committee to meet those requirements and include all of those stakeholders. And then the fifth priority is to build this work-based learning opportunity that AB 38 requires. We need to find a way to connect students with business and industry. And <clears throat> as much as I would think that's an easy task to encounter, it is not. Um, I've been working on it for about a good six months and it is not where I want it to be. Um, I am the work-based learning coordinator as well as CTE facilitator. And this piece alone could keep me busy every day, all day. Because I think that part of my work here should be meeting with businesses every day, saying, what opportunities can you provide our students? How do we get you on board? And that's just not um, feasible at this time, to be honest. So one of the um, ways to be able to recruit and retain employers and connect the employers and the students together is to remove the middle person and let the businesses and the students connect automatically. And there are management, um, management platforms out there that will allow us to do that. Then my work can be just go here and it'll lay it all out for you. Um, and manage and track all of those students and the hours that they're spending and what kind of opportunities they're earning, what kind of opportunities we're offering. And it'll be a huge piece to help manage the data to meet AB 38. Okay. So that document is what will drive how we look to the future as we earn our Perkins funding, how we spend it. And the committee decided that those four or five priorities, even though they're looking finite, they're not finite um, and they're not, they're all aligned in a way, right? Um, to meeting the goals of our Perkins funding as a whole. So it's not like 80% will go to priority one and the, you know, 10% will go to priority two. That's not the way it's looked at because it's, it's fluid because they're all equally as important to serve the other ones. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Questions from the... I'll jump in if nobody's got anything. Go all right. Thank you very much, Heather. I appreciate it. You're Having worked with grants in the past, I know that sometimes the amount received doesn't seem quite comparable to the work put in. <laughs> How much is this grant? Typically, so Perkins is a formula funded grant. And um, I am not even going to begin to even attempt to get into where that formula works or how it works. 
but it's a formula funded grant. And typically it hangs around $100,000 a year. Okay. And we have to apply for that funding yearly, apply for and spend that money in a fiscal year. Okay. Within the, the document that you had sent us that you'd already, the plan that you had already submitted, uh, roughly page six indicated that we need to quote, promote involvement in our JTSAC to our local workforce development office, chambers of commerce, other organizations, et cetera. What is the plan for that? How, how do we do that? Because I also noticed that, for example, the chambers of commerce are not listed in stakeholders, and they may be one of the first places you could go to to engage those employers to become more involved. Sure. So I'm already checking things off of this list, um, and that's one of them. I've met with Billy um, at the Chamber of Commerce to see how she can help me and I can help them and all of the members of the Chamber of Commerce meet those goals. So at some point when they get their new board, I will go present our work-based learning piece to the Chamber of Commerce to see if I can get more employers coming in. Great. And along those lines, through the GBC CTE programs, they have their advisory boards as well. They do. That obviously is a little different level at, at some points, but it's still the pool that they're pulling from. Is that an indication? Is there is there an intention to try to get into to that aspect as well? And in the past, pre-2020, um, our instructors would attend and were invited to those advisory board member, uh, those advisory board meetings. So we could make sure that what we're turning out is in alignment with what they're expecting students to be. So that it's been in place. It's just, a, it's just time to get those wheels turning again. And they will be, GBC of course, will be a big part of our stakeholders because for the most part, where our students leave our programs, they're headed that direction. Okay, and that, thank you, because that actually leads to another question I had further down. Of our multiple programs, how many produce students that are workforce ready immediately versus how many of our programs specifically funnel to a higher education path? And I know that I, that one I kind of just threw out there, but I, mm -hmm. I yeah. Is there, are there programs, I guess, that maybe not how many, but are there programs that say, yep, you're ready for workforce now? We do have programs that are turning students out that are workforce ready. Um, that's a hard data thing to track. We do also do have the majority of our programs are somehow aligned with degree programs that we, that GBC has. Um, however, in my next presentation, when I come in February, our CTE programs are changing in the process of changing. It used to be that students had to stay with us for, say, in a CTE program for three years, then they passed a workplace readiness test and an end of program assessment, earned their certificate of skill attainment, which said they were workforce ready or they were college ready <clears throat> as far as their technical skills are concerned. That three-year program is now turning into a two-year program with the intention that those students will have opportunities for more dual credit opportunities to be taking technical skills across the street or college or work like in the workforce being prepared, internships, externships, job shadowing opportunities, those types of things while they're in their high school program to guarantee in a way that they're ready. Okay, great. While we're on the subject of GBC, and dual credit specifically. In your presentation, I think around page seven, um, you said that dual credit, the cost of dual credits is a barrier to many of our students it that is. would want to go into CTE. So is that is that a district issue? Is that a GBC issue, an NG issue, a state issue, all of the above? So currently students who choose to take dual credits at Great Basin College earn a 50% tuition break, which essentially means that our high school students are expected to pay $58 per credit for lower division courses, plus any tech fees, plus they have to buy their textbooks, plus all of those things. Um, hold on to that thought because in my next presentation, I'll show you why that's a barrier for our students. About 
40 or 50 percent of the students in the CTE programs are considered socioeconomic, right? What we used to refer to as free and reduced lunch. Um, and so the cost of dual credit is absolutely a barrier. The Nevada Department of Education, um, career readiness, adult options, adult learning options, our CTE office at the state level is having conversations with NCHI to, to figure out how to open this up. It is not equitable to our students because students at GBC pay a different rate than students at CSN, different at TMCC, because each college is largely responsible for their procedures and processes. So um, the conversations are happening way above our head to figure out how to make it equitable and make it essentially no cost for high school students wanting to take dual credit because charging students to take classes does not um, allow equity and access for all students. It just doesn't. If there is a way for us as a board or as a district to help influence that manner and that you're aware of, please do let us know. I, I know that, that we can only do so much when it's done in Carson City, but if there are opportunities, I think that, that that's something that when I was at GBC, we talked about all the time as well. Um, being here, being a parent, dual credit, you know, dual credit costs. I think dual credit is a terrific program, but if kids can't afford it, then it's it's great that we offer it, but it's not being utilized like it should. So Agreed. please do let us know. I can interrupt for just a please. second. Just one thing to add on the topic of dual credit. Um, <clears throat> um, the school district does pay for tuition and books for um, English 101, 102, and History 101, 102. And, and that's a that's a long-standing agreement we have with our students. Um, so I couldn't tell you when that started, but um, and that that expenditure just for an FYI, we we just pay for that out of our general fund. Okay, thank you. Around the middle of your document, you mentioned a training with NNRDP. I just butchered that NNR PDP. Yeah, there you go. Um, this past weekend, I believe. How did that go? On Friday, it went well. We had about half of our CTE instructors tune in virtually. Um, virtual is not ideal, but when you have seven high schools on seven different schedules, it was on professional development day. So we did have an opportunity to bring everybody together. It was two hours of an introduction to students who are English learners in our district and how they become and how they are labeled, so to speak, English, English language learners, and the strategies and the needs that they have as a group where we can help them in our current tech ed programs. So okay. it went well, and there's four additional opportunities for our CTE educators to um, take four more sessions related to those strategies and those students either offered before school or after school, depending on which school they go to. Okay. I think that concludes my questions for now. Thank you again. Thanks, Matt. Any other questions? How would the board like to proceed? Mr. Chair, I'm happy to make a motion as soon as I figure out which of the multiple tabs I have open gives me back to my agenda. Does it have to be approved by us? So the state doesn't require me to have an approval. However, because you guys are considered our advisory board, um, an approval to move it forward would, it's just an extra, you guys know what we're doing and how our funding sources are gonna be moving forward. Okay. So Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the ECSD CTE Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment for the Perkins 5 funding. I'll second it. I think it's been moved and seconded to approve the ECSD CTE Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment for Perkins 5 funding. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, a couple more discussion points or maybe, maybe questions that could be clarified. Within the presentation around page four, it indicates that we need to bring new CTE programs on board. 
So in approving this, are we committing the board and as the advisory board or and or the district to develop that plan? Or is that something that you do? Is that something that the Perkins folks do? What's well, so the purpose of that is we are indeed losing CTE programs um, in our district because we are losing qualified teachers and those qualified teaching positions are difficult to fill. The purpose of that piece of that document is districts typically have a plan to grow and what are we going to do next and what do we need to look at next? We don't have one. Many of the other districts do have one for and a procedure for moving forward. When a school calls me and says, I'm going to lose this position, we need to look for a new program to put in our high school to figure out where these kids are going to go and, and align with district. They're, the document would help guide us through that process to make sure that we stay within the boundaries that we need to stay. But it's not necessarily something that we... It is not a commitment. It's just I'm going to continue moving forward on figuring out a plan for our district. Okay. In that same general area, I'm trying to find it now. It indicates that we have to rebuild the Joint Technical Skills Advisory Committee to meet requirements of AB 38. So are we committing anything as a board to that regard? Because if I heard you correctly, we're currently the advisory. You are. AB 38 says we no longer need to be the advisory because it no longer needs to be open meeting law. So are we, is by, by passing this, I guess, is this automatically making the district responsible for finding that new well, board? So um, I'm already kind of responsible for doing it to make sure that we do meet AB 38. The school district, the board of trustees will continue to remain the advisory board until I can put together a full committee, which is probably going to happen next school year. Okay. Um, however, any of you that are interested and want to contribute your skills and abilities and knowledge and contribution to your communities want to serve on that committee, I would be happy to invite you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think that clarifies what I was looking at and just wanted to make sure we knew what we were jumping into, Great. if anything. Thanks. I can add real quick that Heather is, she's amazing at her job, first of all, and she is an incredible resource for our CTE programs in, in Elko County School District and for our students and staff in Elko County School District. Um, moving forward with <clears throat> that sort of an advisory committee, I can also tell you that Heather's passion for her job She's not going to buy just because she won't have to come to you for approval in the future. She's not going to bypass you. She'll prepare these presentations in the same manner to keep you updated on what's going on throughout our district. Thank you. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Any any more debate? Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Chair votes aye and the motion passes. Thank, thank you, you so much for your support. Thank you, Heather. Looking forward to the finished product. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to item 2.02, .02, discussion and possible decision on evaluation tool for interim superintendent evaluation for possible action. So, Mr. Open Chair. I'll kind of jump right in again. I'm telling you guys, you need to kick me under the chair if you're a table, if you need me to, to give you guys a chance to talk. Um, I, I saw the, the um, evaluation tool um, or the, the evaluation matrix that was uh, presented. And I think it, I mean, it fits in with pretty much what we need to do so far. I did have just a couple of, questions and or concerns, I guess, down at the bottom, it indicates contract year and next contract year. Um, obviously, we haven't had Mr. Anderson for a year, and it may be presumptuous to say, what are you going to do next year if it's still in term? So I don't know how to adjust that um, or if it needs to be adjusted, but those were just some things that I noticed there. And I also wanted to make sure that the numbering mechanism that we're using 
with very well being a one, poor, poorly being a five, that we're all understanding that this is like golf, low score is good. So um, that was the only thing that I'm just, it was kind of a reverse of what's common, I think. So um, I didn't really have much to add to that um, as far as an, an advisement as uh, not necessarily advisement, but a evaluation side. So I'm hoping that you all have a little bit more. I uh, just did some searching on Google. Um, I did look at this as well. Um, one thing that came to mind is, and I'm, this looks good to me, but we need to have some goals and I think those need to be developed and then put as part of the evaluation so that Mr. Anderson knows what those goals are working toward, um, what he's working toward. And uh, so that was one piece that I think is missing. Um, I did, and I'm just, these are just, I'm just brainstorming, if you will. Um, one of the things I found um, interesting, um, some school districts developed their superintendent, the evaluation part, uh, the, the superintendent developed a portfolio just so that you have documentation proof of things that you did that we may not always be aware of every single thing that you do. And that way it helps all of us like, wow, look what you did for this month. However, you keep track of it. I did like that idea in some ways. It, it wouldn't have to be some huge portfolio, you know, but I did like the idea of that you had some things um, that you wanted us to be aware of, even if that's at a monthly meeting that you say that um, and then compile it all at the end. Um, I think that's good for the public to know as well as us that these are the things I've been working on or this is what took a lot of my time this month or however we do the um, evaluation. I mean, I know we're talking soon, um, but even if it's quarterly, like I said, I'm just throwing ideas out there. Um, another one was um, to keep it as, you know, have formative and summative assessment kind of what teachers are used to as well, um, which that's not a, a bad idea. Um, I think those were kind of my notes from what I took that I found online. And a lot of them had things like this in addition to the, the written part of, you know, here's what I did, here's how I accomplished. I did print out, sorry, I just printed this out, but um, it's from New York, um, but I liked the idea. It had um, what we're looking at. It had some of those details, but then it also had on the side, what could help you determine how effective that was. So um, like possible data sources and documents. So based on the criteria over here, here's what he did or used to get to that point. Because some of those might, I don't know, what does that mean? Like, you know, what you think is different than what I might think. And they had that for each section, um, basically of the sections we have is kind of developed for each of those sections. So I did kind of like that I can, make copies, pass it around, whatever. Um, I did kind of like that too. And maybe I'm going overboard <laughs> and it's too much and we don't need that much right now for an interim for right now and develop it further for next year. Just thoughts that I've thrown out there. All right, <clears throat> this is Teresa. Can I interject for a minute, Ira? Yes. Okay, sorry if my voice is a little scratchy. Um, <clears throat> Just for the information of the board, the district does have a longer evaluation document. Um, this is an abbreviation of an abbreviated version. Um, just simply, um, when I talked with CJ about this, you know, we're we're starting to evaluate him on a very short period of time, serving as our interim, and 
I didn't think his time was best spent, and this is of course the will of the board, but I didn't think his time was best spent putting together all of those artifacts for a full evaluation. Um, he's got a lot of hats to juggle right now with uh, his, his interim position as well as his previous job that he's doing as well. So I figured, and like I say, this is the will of the board, but I thought an abbreviated version of an evaluation would be a wiser course of action right now. Um, however, you know, adjustments like what Matt said, I think, you know, obviously that can be made. We can look at those details and quickly strike out um, things that are incorrect, like what you mentioned at the beginning, Matt, and we can add criteria, take criteria away. Um, the document for the evaluation is just a suggestion, but we do need to have that available as uh, we've asked CJ to give us a self-evaluation, I believe the first meeting in February, and then the board will do the board evaluation the second meeting in February. Is that correct, Ira, as far as the timeline goes? Yeah, yep, that's what we came up with, put, put the pressure on. <laughs> but, uh, yep, any more? I would say I'm fine with the, uh, the format here because I believe, uh, well, for one, it's numbers and everything, but it's not like there's a sliding scale on the bottom that's A, B, C, D, E, F. We are, we're gonna know at the end whether the evaluation is good or, or bad. I will mention though on scoring on the don't know, or I had a question about uh, there's situations that just haven't had the opportunity to happen yet, but if we mark it as a zero, that's even better than a one. So on the scoring, I, I good would point. like to throw that out there, but again, at the end of the day, does it really matter? I don't think so. Right, what we're going to know either way. I mean, these are great uh, uh, char characteristics to look at in different aspects of how the superintendent performs. And I think there, there's enough here for us to cover enough ground to, to make an informed decision on, on what an evaluation would be. That's my two cents. Would it be appropriate for me to chime in? I know talking about me, but um, <laughs> just... Uh, so you're aware of the, the way I'm looking at this and the way I understand this from when we um, first talked about the contract was uh, kind of the timeline Teresa just said and Ira confirmed is, you know, for the next board meeting, I would present you with um, a self evaluation, how I'd rate myself on these things. And, and I'd, I would present a form of portfolio. I'm, I'm not gonna hand you a folder or anything, but I will, do my best to toot my own horn on the things that I feel like I've done well and and accurately and honestly reflect on things that I feel like I can probably continue to improve on. Um, it is my understanding that this mechanism is not meant to be a long-term evaluation, but to help guide you in your decision on whether or not you will want to pursue a uh, another search for a different candidate or if you would want to continue with me as a long-term solution. So try to think of it from that aspect. And I would assume that, let's say hypothetically, you were to continue with me, that this is a one-time use of this one document. And it would then, of course, extend to, you know, if there were another contract, then that would, there would be a more elaborate uh, evaluation tool with obviously more summative data to use. Um, but that given that we're at I think we're just embarking upon week six of my, I don't even feel appropriate using the word tenure, my, my, my time. Um, that, uh, that, so that's kind of my understanding of it. And I don't know if that helps change perspective or maybe you're already there and I'm just saying it differently, but I just thought I'd throw those comments in. Yeah, that's, that was the, the intent. I mean, it's pretty quick and, and you're busy and, but to be brief and, to find out if you still like us and if we still like you is pretty much what it, if you said, no, I'm, I'm out, I'm not going to do this anymore. Or, you know, we're going to continue is basically what it was, what it was geared towards being brief, but to the point. And don't you think we could, um, if it came to it, um, we could use it again before the end of June. If, if we were to decide that just to continue it a little longer so that we're still kind of keeping a touch um, on both ends because we, we want you to know that and guide and support you. 
So we could even use it again as a, a check in later as we go along before your interim part ends in June. Just a thought. There's a, it's a mandated evaluation, isn't it, in May? Each district has to evaluate their superintendent every year. Is that right, Key? I'm not positive on the NRS. We, we have we have NRS for um, for our for our teachers, but I'm not sure because I know we've done them in the past. With I, I can't imagine that what you're talking about wouldn't serve that purpose. Wouldn't serve that yeah. purpose, right? Yeah, May, Teresa, do you know? Oh, I, excuse me, I can't quote the NRS, but I believe we have to do it prior to a certain date. Um, yeah. And we can look that up and, and find that date. But I believe um, even if we use this tool now, it would certainly satisfy the need to provide an evaluation in a public meeting. I am sure that the date isn't the same as teachers. For teachers, it would be um, on or before, I believe, the 120th day of school. And that's oh. like soon. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm sure that that date is not the same. Um, I, prior to um, considering stepping into this role, I did an evaluation of every board meeting that happened from the last six to eight years or so. And just from a quick search of my documentation, it looks like these super superintendent evaluations typically occurred in June. Typically, they were giving themselves a self-evaluation in May, and you were usually in receipt of that sometime around the same time, or maybe in April. So not having been in it myself, but I, those are the notes I had from my research. CJ gets a one on research. <laughs> yeah, I believe one of those is prepared for meetings. So go ahead and shock that one up. <laughs> As we move forward, regardless of of the current incumbent, but on the evaluation, if there is an opportunity to, to review that, I think, I think uh, Susan brings up some good points on making sure that goals is part of that, and it may already be part of that. Uh, but I do like the idea also of the data sources and the documentation of how are we assessing that. Um, the other day, and not to jump too far ahead, but the other day I happened to be um, at a Poetry Out Loud reading. And I was looked over and there's Mr. Anderson in, in a, you know, an auditorium that I really wasn't expecting that. He didn't have any of his children, his biological children, because, you know, I mean, he's kind of adopted about 10,000 of them when he took that seat. But, um, but I just, those are things that I might know of that others don't. And so I think that, that Susan's point of the data source of the documentation, I think that that could be helpful. Um, and that would also be helpful on the portfolio. So... I'll make sure to let you know, I promise. <laughs> I agree too, I'd like more on there, but I think in the interest of time and what we're looking at in the timeline with the uh, with this document uh, it would be sufficient for our purposes coming up in the end of February. And if it's all right, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion that we accept this uh, spreadsheet as presented for our evaluation coming up on uh, the second meeting in February. I'll second that. So we've got a motion and a second to accept this spreadsheet as an evaluation. Is there any more to discussion? Briefly, yes, Jeff, I agree. Don't we don't need to change it now? I'm just looking at long term. And I think we do need to just make sure that the zeros, because I did test it quickly. And yeah, the zeros, it doesn't throw the zeros out, it does count it towards that. So we need to make sure that I don't know doesn't doesn't benefit him unfairly. And I think maybe a don't know would also be an opportunity for, uh, I mean, I, I feel like after doing a self-evaluation and presenting you with all that, um, I would I would be interested uh, how you would say, I don't know, because um, since I would have explained, but I would, that would be a great time maybe to ask more questions if you wanted to, and, and I'd be happy to provide more information. So um, yeah, uh, you know, no pun intended, but I don't know why that's even a category there because uh, presumably you would want to come up with a number before giving a rating instead of just saying IDK, right? The only reason I present that is there may be certain situations that just haven't occurred yet because of the short amount of time. There may not have been an issue that you need, needed to bring to me yet, for example, so I can't really rate you on that, but it doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. There's just nothing 
that, that magnitude happened uh, or I, I'm just speaking off of without reading it, but I'm sure there's other questions that might have similar circumstances that just haven't had the opportunity to apply yet. So that's the only thing in scoring, but again, it's doesn't, there's not a scale down at the bottom that says good, very good, whatever. We still, we're going to know. Yep. So. I was, I was just going to chime in and say with the board having this rubric and uh, Mr. Anderson having this rubric, correct. We should not have any, I don't knows when it comes to the board doing the evaluation, because if there is an, I don't know, um, when Mr. Anderson is doing his self-evaluation, then we will need to discuss that. Yeah, I suppose if my answer was, I don't know if I've done that or not, you can probably feel confident giving me a five. <laughs> um, that's, I'll have to eat that if I can't answer what I've done in that category. Um, I will say just from uh, reviewing these things myself, I don't see anything here. Uh, the, the, this was put together clearly with the intent to be things that are measurable for the brief period of time that I will have been doing this. And so from my glance and looking at them and uh, that they are all things that um, I should have had at least some opportunity to do during this time. And I'm confident I'll be able to speak to it. Okay, we've got a motion in a second. No more discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those, <clears throat> those opposed? Chair votes aye and the motion passes. Moving on to the item 3.01, the consent agenda. Mr. Chair, move to accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Chair votes aye and the consent agenda is passed. On to item 4.01, a report from our NASP director. This is my first time at this. I really have nothing to report and we have a uh, Meeting coming up uh, February 5th, a joint board meeting in Sparks. I'll be attending that and uh, looking forward to getting started, even though they're, like say, in the legislative year, I've been told there may not be much going on, but I'll do what I can to make sure we're well represented there. Any questions, comments for the NASB director? Great first report. <laughs> <laughs> Turn nothing into something. <laughs> Okay, moving on to item 4.02, items from board members. I have a couple. Um, working on the STARS committee, trying to get a committee put together and just kind of uh, renewing, refreshing the um, verbiage on the nomination form. Um, and I've been working with Mr. Anderson on that. Um, I visited Southside the other day. Um, it was fun to go in and see, um, I spoke with the vice principal and then she took me to the preschool room, which was so fun, um, and out to the kindergarten to go out there and just, just kind of walked around the school a little bit. Um, so we had a nice visit. Um, she expressed how great the parents have been, um, how, um, they've just been a good, support system, like a good team, parents, children, students, um, the staff there, and they just supported one another, especially during this COVID time. So that was good to hear. And then I visited Flagview and um, spoke with the principal there. Um, he, among other things we talked about, but he talked about, they started, um, he helped them start a, um, STEM club after school, and then they're doing um, like a writing slash book club to try to meet other kids that are more into that than the, the STEM. And then he started uh, like a, um, what do I wanna say? Um, gosh, an intervention, thank you, I wrote it down. 
a math intervention that they do in the mornings. And then he's, I don't know if he's worked with Cassie or if I'm assuming probably, but some grant money so that um, they have some money for these type of activities. Um, so it'll be interesting to see um, how well those work since they've just gotten started on that. So it was fun to get out there too. Oh, and one other thing, maybe you can finish with, um, I was just thinking about the spelling bee. Um, I did go to the spelling bee and I haven't been to a county spelling bee and I don't, I don't even remember the last time I went. So it was very interesting to see the process. And I'm just so thankful I wasn't involved in the spelling bee. because I'm like, <laughs> It looked pretty scary to me, but maybe talk about where they go, that, where the winner goes instead of, I was just thinking of that. So, so that's all I have, thanks. I've got a list. <laughs> Anybody want to go first? All right. Um, so last at the last meeting, Catherine Kelly had uh, emailed and there were a couple of times that we've heard this about the curriculum. And just to put that out there, in listening to the fellow board meetings or board members during meetings and, and during our, our goals workshop, et cetera, I believe that the board agrees before I get too far, this is not speaking on behalf of the board, this is my interpretation solely as a trustee of one. Um, I believe that the board does agree that we need to move forward with new curriculum, including math, social studies, and science. And that we have learned that the district has a seven-year rotation schedule for new curriculum. At the recent goal setting workshop, the board discussed returning to that schedule. And my understanding is that we will be working forward with staff to uh, work with our stakeholders to begin that process. Um, which I understand includes review and evaluation of options, limited rollout, and then finally a district district wide implementation, total process taking two ish academic years or so. So we do hear from the administrators, the schools, from the teachers, from the parents that yes, this is something that needs to be there. It is a something that we are working on um, as we move forward on that. With that said, I'm going to kind of um, go into a little bit of a diatribe here, and I appreciate your patience. Again, this is my thoughts, my thoughts only as an individual trustee. This is not respective of the uh, entire board, and it is with all due respect to my other board members, to the staff, and to especially our legal counsel. And I'm going to read this word for word because I spent some time trying to make sure I smithed it as best as possible. So in my three months since my appointment, I've been asked by a number of people why I do not respond to public comment. First, I was informed that previously the board has been advised by legal counsel not to engage during public comment. I have no reason to doubt the opinion of our legal counsel, nor, nor to believe that such counsel is designed to produce opaque proceedings. While I have been on public boards and associated with public bodies that allow responses to public comment, I chose to respect the guidance issued to this board. In researching further, the Open Meeting Law Manual, published by the Office of the Attorney General of the State of Nevada, over multiple iterations, including both political parties, states that to deliberate is to examine, weigh, and reflect upon the reasons for or against the choice. Deliberation thus connotes not only collective discussion, but the collective acquisition or the exchange of facts preliminary to the ultimate decision. It further goes on to state, quote, agenda items must be described with clear and complete detail so that the public will receive notice and fact of what is to be discussed by the public body, end quote. Issues brought up during public comment and less pertaining to an item on the agenda have not been presented in such a manner as to conform to the requirements of the open meeting law manual sorry, the open meeting law, specifically that the public must receive notice in fact of what is to be discussed. Based on this, because I want to ensure that I conduct myself in as open a manner as possible and to ensure that I'm complying with state law, I generally have chosen not to respond to public comment while on this board. In researching further, section 7.04 of the open meeting law manual states in part, Discussion of public comment is specifically allowed under NRS 2410202D3. This statute was amended in 1991. Now it allows discussion of public comment within the public body, end quote. 
I believe the correct NRS is actually 2410203D3, which states in part that notice of all meetings must include an agenda consisting of, among other things, periods devoted to comments by the general public, if any, and discussion of those comments. Therefore, should I have a response moving forward to public comment and accepting any other guidance that I receive from staff, from board members, and from legal counsel, my procedure is that I'm going to wait to see what my fellow trustees have to say, if anything, before I reply. So as to appear to avoid the appearance of any deliberation, I will do my best to avoid making more than one comment or engaging in a back and forth discussion with either the public or our uh, trustees or the staff. So I hope that this answers some of the questions as to why I have been silent during public comment. Uh, I hope that it uh, provides an indication of what can be expected of me as an individual moving forward. Thank you, my diatribe is over. Any more items from board members? Thanks, Matt, I'm sure you spent- All of that. Bit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you spent some time on that. So um, I appreciate you taking the time to do that diving in um, because it is important that we all know what we're, what's expected of us and um, what we have to do. So I appreciate it. Yeah, so I've been coaching junior jazz <laughs> and uh, it's been at the Wendover Elementary School and it, what a great experience that's been. It's a just a beautiful facility, the way it's able to divide up into four courts and uh, the baskets will raise and lowered with just the turn of a key so we can get the little kids, you know, the guys that I come in before have the eight foot hoop set up and then my girls shoot on a 10 and they have it right up. And I just, what a great facility. I hope that uh, throughout all the communities is, I haven't got, really got a chance to visit too much yet, but I would like to be able to provide this experience to all of our students. It's a great, great facility over there and i'm really happy that the school district is able to work with the rec district in order to make that happen because there really aren't any alternatives at least over there in wendover of places to play so thanks to the district for that and just to speak individually i've really really enjoyed the experience over there that's all i have <clears throat> um matt i appreciate you explaining that that was a, that was a good explanation of public comment and why some we do or don't make make comments during public comment. Nothing else. We'll move on to item 5.01, the superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, I do have, I, I may put Matt to shame tonight. I, I got some stuff to talk about with you, but um, uh, before I get into some of the items I have, uh, I mean, listed there on the, Agenda, there is a construction update and there is an enrollment comparison. Does anyone have questions about those specific things before I? What is the conservation camp? Um, the enrollment. Sorry, where, where are you identifying that on those documents? The enrollment. Oh, sorry, let me move over to that. Those are the wells in Carlin. Um, conservation camps and incarcerated adults and we provide, oh okay we adult adult ed, yeah to them. okay when you said conservation camp i was thinking like science <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> summer conservation yes those are those are adults uh incarcerated facilities okay and who's in charge of that uh adult ed like duty or we have we have a couple of adult ed teachers dean stevens is the adult ed teacher and alt ed teacher in west wendover and he is the instructor for the conservation camps. Oh, okay. Thanks, Keith. Um, if I may, and I apologize, Mr. Anderson, the, at our last meeting, Mr. Kelly had uh, discussed what we we're looking at with roughly the 18 million. Um, and in looking at the construction update, I believe I may have misunderstood that the construction update on here, some of these maybe projects that are needed to be of an expedient nature. If Mr. Kelly can have a presentation on that, or at least come back for some questions at a later date, I would appreciate that. Yep. I can talk with him about, uh, I mean, if 
I'm assuming a couple of weeks would be fine to get that together. So I'll talk Absolutely. to him about having a more formal explanation of that for next meeting, if that's okay. Yep. Thank you. I just awesome. would like to see that maybe a, a suggested ranking of some type or what can be pushed for four to five years. Kind of like order priority type. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thank Thanks you. That. Awesome. Um, okay. So uh, we have had a, it's been a busy week or two. Um, so uh, I, I've got some happy things to talk about. I'm going to save those for the end. And I'm going to give, uh, I mean, state of the union's kind of dramatic, but I'm going to give you a state of our schools right now in regards to how uh, COVID and the Omicron surge is impacting our schools. Um, so just so you're aware, and I'm, I'm assuming you know this, but again, I'm not just talking to the board. I'm, you know, we have other people listening too. So uh, we have, we currently have four schools that are, have, have entered into outbreak status. Um, Elko High School and Spring Creek High have been there for a little bit. Um, maybe I think we're working on a couple of weeks now. Um, Adobe entered there uh, kind of late last week. And then uh, just yesterday, we received notification that West Wendover High School would be entering. And today they started that. Um, in addition to those that were declared an outbreak status by the DHHS, um, Owyhee, um, they have gone to full virtual um, school mode again, and that's been going for about a week and almost a half now. Uh, that was done at the wishes of the tribal council out there. They were seeing um, really high numbers, um, positive cases uh, spiking in their community, and they felt uh, not, not just schools, but they they sent a letter to their whole community and, and asked for our support in helping them uh, kind of just support them in doing that. And so uh, we, we of course did and made everything, uh, made all the arrangements we, we could in, in that moment. And we are still going through virtual mode. Um, they asked for a two five day incubation period type uh, of, you know, time to evaluate and maybe hope, hopefully stem that tide. But uh, so we, the end of this week would be the conclusion of that initial two weeks they were thinking about. Um, and so we are, we are planning on returning back to in-person learning again next week or to their, you know, their previous model, um, unless something changes and they, they want to work with us more on maybe a different solution. So, but that's what we're planning on doing there. Um, oh yeah, go ahead. Before you go any further. Um, so is it up to the tribal council then for them to come back as well? Or do they talk with you about coming back? We just work closely with them. I mean, technically, uh, you know, we, we make the decisions for schools, um, but more important than the technicalities is our relationship with the community and, and, and how we work together. And so um, I'm, you know, not being out there and having those conversations myself. I do know that Mr. Streeter and uh, Ms. John Manning, the, the two of them are constantly in contact with the tribal council and, um, they, they communicate back and forth on a, probably a, a daily to semi-daily basis. Um, even when they're not an outbreak, they are communicating a lot with, with the tribal council. So they'll, they'll let us know kind of what they're thinking and we'll, we'll support them. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Um, so something that, uh, not only board members, but a lot of community members are aware of is, uh, I'm going to talk about athletic testing for a little bit. Um, Historically, so at the beginning of the school year, we were utilizing uh, rapid tests to test our athletes. We had a an agreement with, uh, was it the, the county, Keith, county ambulance service? Yeah, but it was more of a favor than an agreement. <laughs> okay, not an agreement. They were being super nice and helping us accomplish that, okay? And we are, we are grateful that they did that. Um, that became cumbersome. And I believe at that point in time, rapid tests were, uh, were hard to come by. And, uh, so a lot of, uh, talk happened and we ended up moving to PCR tests, uh, and we threw a company called color and what that looks like and has looked like is kids get those tests done on a Monday under supervision of their coaches and nurses and administrators, and they get stuffed in tubes and in boxes and mailed off to a company. And we would usually get those results within 48 hours. We'd know by Wednesday, um, what those results were. Uh, that was, I mean, once we got all the kinks worked out, it was working great. 
we were chugging along as, as scheduled. Uh, Christmas passed, Omicron arrived, and um, the last two weeks we've had, uh, you know, two weeks ago, the results took three closer to four days to come in. And then last week it took four, some five days to come in. Uh, that's obviously problematic given the, um, the updated guidelines, which say that a five day quarantine or um, isolation period um, is, is all you need in order to be able to come back after testing positive. Cause if it takes five days for your test to come in, your quarantine and isolation is done. If I test on a Monday, the results come on a Friday or a Saturday then now what's the point of doing it, right? So um, I want to personally, uh, you know, even though I am not the color company, nor have I, you know, committed an infraction of any kind, I still want to apologize to the people who, uh, and us included, we, we were relying on that system. And that system definitely has let us down the last couple of weeks. And this last week being the most, difficult of those uh, because we had kids in Winnemucca, we had kids in Fallon, um, we had kids in different parts of the state. And uh, more ideally, it's, it's worse than ideally, but I'm going to say ideally anyway. Ideally, you would have those things figured out before you send kids off um, and inconvenience families. And I'm, I'm really sorry uh, for, for how that went down last week. Uh, a lot of people were frustrated. Um, discouraged and lost trust in that system. And uh, I echo the frustrations and I echo the loss of trust in that system. Um, that being said, uh, many questions were posed to me and our other district leaders about why are we doing that if it's not working? Not only is it not working, it's not meeting the the intention that it had, right? Like it's it's not doing what it's supposed to do. So why are we spinning our wheels if we're not... Uh, wasn't there a holiday at the beginning of that week? Wouldn't that have affected how, you know, that's a day right there. That... There was. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, last week, and, and that only made it worse, right? Because we didn't have school on a Monday. So we tested on a Tuesday. Uh, and those results came in um, kind of early in the morning on Saturday. Uh, so would we have caught some of those kids before they were gone? Because uh, some of those buses were, were gone and competing on Friday already. Um, even if we had caught them though, Jeff, it is my opinion that that is still way too long. And those kids spent all week in school positive. Right. And, and I think we all agree there that um, it's still a problem. Uh, so uh, a few questions were posed to me and I really should be reading off my notes, but um, I'm kind of <laughs> spitballing right now, but um, uh, several questions were posed to me about why we're doing that. Um, and a, a few things were brought up. Some community members asked, uh, said something like, we have heard that there are districts and counties that are just not, they're not testing. So why are we testing if they're not, or if they don't have to? Uh, I wanna clarify that there are no districts that are not testing, at least at least not in uh, word, they're not. Um, those, it is required um, of the NIAA and DHHS and um, in order to, not only in order to participate, but what we, uh, wh where that notion came from was at one point early on in this process, like months ago, one of one of the districts was worried about how they would make that work, didn't think they could, made the testing an optional process. That got squashed real quick, um, not only because of the requirements that existed, but because other school districts were unwilling to play their schools if they weren't gonna play by the same rules. So that is, how that, you know, so if, if there is a comment that you hear that others are not, I suppose it was true for a very, very brief period of time, um, but everyone is testing. Um, and just to, so the next comment I got from people was, um, why are we doing PCR testing if others can do rapid testing? Um, so I, I pulled, I, we immediately got to work yesterday and today, we, that's pretty much the majority of what we, I, I say we, that's me, that's Keith, that's it's Candace, it's Ray, it's Bobby, it's all of our uh, district leaders that that have a hand in this. And so we've been working on what we can do to switch over to rapid testing if it's even feasible um, for our district. So uh, roughly half of the rural communities are doing the same PCR testing we are, and, and half of them are are doing uh, rapid testing. Uh, we are uh, we're, we're looking at how we can make that change to rapid testing. There's a couple of challenges that exist, and I just want everyone to be very 
you know, I want to be open about what those challenges are. So, you know, we're, we're trying, okay. Now, the first challenge is getting your hands on uh, enough tests. Uh, we, last week, we tested roughly uh, right about 200 kits. Um, we were testing a lot more than that, but given the current guidelines, which we follow from DHHS and NIAA, um, students that are, uh, that are totally vaccinated and students that have tested positive within the last 90 days are not required to test. Um, so that number goes down as, as time goes on because more people are either vaccinated and or, and or I should say test positive. Um, but getting our hands on enough tests is going to be a challenge. Um, we, we are reaching out to multiple, um, sources, uh, trying to find funding for it. Um, it's not easy, but that is one of the challenges. So we are, but we are actively working on that. The other challenge that exists there is, uh, just so people are aware, is in order to um, meet the criteria and, and, and satisfy the requirement, it is not good enough for us to simply uh, take a home test and have, I'm, I'm willing to help swab people if that would get the trick done, but it's, it's, it doesn't get the trick done. In order for these tests to be considered valid, um, they have to be uh, performed either by a, an individual who is what is called CLIA certified or a clinic or institution that is CLIA certified. Um, CLIA is C-L-I-A, and that stands for Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments. Um, certified is the wrong word. Licensed is the right word. They have to be CLIA licensed. Um, so uh, we are not CLIA licensed as a district. Our nurses are not CLIA licensed. That is a special license you have to get. Uh, our nurses could get CLIA licensed. However, that is a four to 12 week turnaround, um, by which point Omicron will be long gone. Um, who knows if there's another one coming or not, but they would be, that, that, that wouldn't help us right now. Um, what we're doing is we're trying to reach out to community partners in every one of the outlying communities and within town, so to speak, to find licensed institutions or individuals under CLIA who would be willing to help us facilitate and instead of having an ambulance service do it all for us as a favor and us be grateful, um, try, trying to approach it from a many hands make light work uh, perspective. And maybe one group can do this group of kids here, one there, one there. And we're hoping that, uh, that we can have that support from those institutions. Um, so we are in the process of trying to reach out. And that is all under the assumption that we can secure the test because those institutions have their own problems getting their hands on tests as they get them from different sources. So assuming we can get our hands on tests and assuming we can get these people to help us, then we could change to rapid testing. So that's kind of the lay of what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, we are spending a lot of time on trying to make that work. Um, because not testing is not an option um, as much as we would love to not have to test. That's not an option for us. Um, so that is, that is what I have to say about the athletic testing that went on uh, and, what, and where we're at with that. And just uh, again, one more time, I wanna echo or say the same thing of, we, uh, we are not happy about what happened either. Um, and I feel for the kids and I feel for the families that were put out and, Really sorry about that. Um, we are actively, like actively, I wish I could use a stronger word than actively, but we are actively working to make, to fix this and make a, find a better solution. Um, in addition to the questions that were posed that I mentioned before, um, I guess I can pause. Does anyone have a question about something I've set up to this point? Cause I've been running my mouth. Uh, has NIA shown any guidance on this at all? The state, how long, I mean, this testing, obligation has that been a year-long thing i mean it was a start do they adjust that at all is there any chance they can you know if we take something like this to them and say hey this happened uh, and this is stupid <laughs> i mean it's um, you know four days in i mean is that any thing we can try uh we can certainly you know i wouldn't use the word stupid well, but yeah, you, you, well, I know, I know. it is though when you got you know five day of incubation and it takes four and a half to get it back what's the point doesn't make a whole lot Who's of sense making the money on that, yeah you know um, so yes, we can petition to NIAA. Um, I'm, Keith, at the end of the winter, did you want to speak to end of the winter season? 
I guess the, the quickest response, um, Trustee Durham, is, is the NIAA Board of Control does have monthly meetings. Yeah. And um, that has been a topic uh, of discussion in the past is, is whether um, the testing will be required throughout the, the year or not. And, and the other question is whether that's even up to the NIAA or not. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we are asking those questions as well. A, a few people have emailed me and said, we encourage you or plead with you to ask those questions of other people. And we are. Um, in addition to NIA, um, I, along with uh, with many superintendents across the state, uh, very, you know, definitely including the rural counties, um, we are also constantly um, working on how we are, how we can petition and adequately and properly communicate the challenges we are seeing at the local level, um, not just with athletic testing, but on a broader perspective. Um, another question that was brought into, um, that was brought up at, at, at because of the situation was our contact tracing. Um, when you have, uh, so for example, last on Saturday, the results we got from that athletic testing, we tested 199 kids and 64 of them were positive tests. That's just over a 32% positivity rate. That, that's high. Um, and that doesn't include people who didn't get tests because if we're being perfectly honest, um, people who are vaccinated are also contracting the disease, right? Like that's happening um, or the virus. So um, that, that only accounts for those in athletics. On top of that, we have a lot of schools with a lot of cases. Contact tracing has become a very, very, very burdensome process for our nurses, our secretaries who are helping, our administrators who are helping, everyone who's chipping in to try to make that happen. We are doing our very best as a district to comply, uh, for lack of a better word, with, with contact tracing requirements. Um, this week, uh, oh, sorry, before I get into that, a, a question was posed by many people as well to me. We have heard other counties are not contact tracing. Why are we doing it? Um, my answer for everyone there is, um, there is one county that is not contact tracing. It is widely known they're not contact tracing. And that is Washoe County. Um, to answer why they are doing, they are not doing contact tracing and we are, you know, I don't work in Washoe and I don't know everything about it, but my rough understanding of that situation is uh, there's a, there's two real main differences in what's going on. Number one, Washoe works under, or they are uh, not governed by, but they, they have a different local health authority than we do. They have a they have their own in Washoe County, and while the health authorities do have very similar um, guidances from the state, our guidance comes directly from the Nevada Department of Health and Human Services. They are our local health authority. They are our health authority for all things related to this. So that's one, they have a different health authority. Number two, uh, a little background on how Washoe got to this point. Number one, Washoe County School District, to my understanding, never did contact tracing because they their health authority was doing it for them. Their health authority was contact tracing for the community and for the schools. When it became so burdensome for the for the um, the health authority that they couldn't keep up with the schools anymore, they let the schools know, hey, we, we can't do it anymore. Kind of like our ambulances said, hey, we, we can't do this anymore. Um, they said, well, we also can't do it. Um, and the concession was made that because Washoe County is a school district that has 100% of kids in masks all the time, that under the new guidelines from CDC and DHHS, um, where if you are within or if you are three feet or farther apart from another person and you are both masked properly, then you are not considered a close contact. So by everyone wearing masks all the time and the new guidelines, there's no point to doing contact tracing because presumably you are three feet or more apart from each other when you're at school. So that is how Washoe to my, and that is my rudimentary understanding as a superintendent of a different district and what I've heard from other health professionals from the state, that is why Washoe is able to do that. And most other people are not because Washoe and Clark are the only two counties that are mandated to wear masks all the time. 
Um, so it would help our contact tracing efforts if everybody wore masks all the time. However, um, if we're being realistic about how uh, our community as a whole feels about that, I, I, we know how they all feel about that. Um, and uh, I am not willing to unilaterally mandate that we all wear masks all the time. Um, do I think there would be benefits to it? Yes. Do I think it would help our nurses and our staff out a lot? I do. Uh, do I think it would um, not reflect the desires of our community? I also think that it would not. So um, I'm not in a position where I'm going to just, not, not that I think I could anyway, it feels more like a board would have to do that. Um, and I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just letting you know where we're at with that. Jeff, you got something you look like you want to. Yeah, well, I got a million things I want to say, but I'm not going to say them right here. It just okay. doesn't, uh, I the whole thing to me, I, I think stupid was completely appropriate. <laughs> I, I, I just wouldn't use it in a formal setting. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Yeah, there's, there's and, problems and you, with it. Yeah, I, yeah. but I, I mean, when you, when you put the nuts and bolts and when you lay it out like that, and it, you know, you're four and a half, five days in and testing and, and it's already done. It's like, what's the point? Now, yeah. If I could think of one word. That's the first one that came. It's an easy mind. one. Yep. I'll, I'll, I'll work on that. <laughs> so um, one thing, just, just so people know, again, I, I, I want to be very clear what we are doing um, because there is a prevailing sentiment from a lot of people that we are, and I don't, I'm not blaming anyone for this, but that we are sitting here and just waiting to be told what to do. And that is not accurate. We are constantly seeing how we can make it better. We are seeking change that'll help our schools out. Um, just this week, uh, be, because keeping in mind the concept of if if the reason they don't have to contact trace is because there are masks all the time, then it is my opinion that the same concept should apply to schools that are in outbreak status. If I have four high schools that are, uh, sorry, three high schools and a middle school that are currently in outbreak status, theoretically, they're all wearing their masks. Theoretically, they're also all three feet or more apart all the time. So uh, I'm logically following that we should be able to do the same thing as a school district, at least for those schools that they are able to accomplish. Um, I have, I, I made those desires known. Uh, there are people in this room as my witness that I, someone called me feisty to this week and, um, and I let them know not only that we should get that, that same treatment, but more than anything, like we are, some of our people are, just wearing themselves into the ground, doing, trying to, we're doing our very best to, to keep up with this, right? But it's, it is wearing people down. And if we knew it was wearing them down for a good reason, then that's something people can accept. But when it's not, or when it's not accomplishing what we want to accomplish, um, then that's, that's tougher to swallow. And so um, more than anything, aside from what I've asked, because I can ask for I can ask for anything. I, I can go tell them I want a million bucks. I can go tell, I, I can ask for whatever I want. Um, doesn't mean we're going to get it, but more than anything, I, I communicated to them, just like I'm communicating to you all tonight, the reality of our situation and certain aspects of it that are not sustainable. And more importantly, um, they don't make sense. Yes. So I've, I've, I've made that, I have made that very clear to people who, whose opinions carry weight um, uh, in, in, in this matter and who we take some direction from. So to borrow from Josh, <laughs> we're doing everything we can to follow guidance that's been given to us. These are not decisions that we make. These are things that are being sent to us from the state that we have to follow. Correct. We are following things we have to follow. Um, but to give an analogy, uh, I, I can tell my son that um you know he's not allowed to play his video games um and he will comply with me but i knowing my son he's going to be he's going to be working me the whole time when he can get it back what he can get like what he can do to get what he needs and what he wants um so i'm while complying i am working the appropriate avenues that i need to work to try to get what we want and i shouldn't just say i i i'm speaking for the the, the other people at this district who have a similar interest. Okay. Um, all right. Next, I got I got one more 
tough reality to share with you. And then I'll close with some positives. Okay. And I appreciate everyone hanging with me. Um, what I'm about to tell you uh, is, and I want you to keep this following sentence in mind as I tell you the next things I'm about to tell you. We are, and we have done everything in our abilities to keep our schools open, okay? That's what I want you, with everything I say from now on, I want you to keep that in mind. This is all to keep our schools open. I heard of, I saw a video very recently from a certain news source that it's stated somewhere at the bottom that teachers don't wanna work right now. Um, and that was very, that was very hard to look at, not because I think it's a reality. It was hard to look at because I know it not to be true. Our teachers love their kids. They care about them. They will do anything for them. Um, and there is a perspective that people don't want to work. And I, and I patently disagree with it. My notes just disappeared. My computer died. Um, I, I disagree with it. Um, what we are doing, um, is, to keep our schools open is, is amazing. I'm so proud of our administrators. I'm proud of our nurses. I'm proud of our staff. Uh, I lament that this just went away because I have some spreads. We've been keeping data um, on. Uh, yeah, if you could. It, this wonderful. One? Uh, it's got a little round end. Oh. No, it's like, actually, no, it, that would work. That would work. Yeah. Thank you. I apologize for the interruption. That's what I get for running on too long. Um, <clears throat> Blame me. We've been, <laughs> yeah, it's your fault. You're the one with all the questions. Um, we have been keeping track of, uh, I guess I'll, I'll go back a little bit. Um, there was a pause in Clark recently, right? And the pause in Clark that people heard about was because they did not think they could keep enough staff in the buildings to safely and appropriately educate students and run their buildings. Uh, Washoe recently had to close down Hug High School for a day. Um, uh, other, other schools were in the same boat. They were, they're having to close schools. Um, yeah, this says this doesn't work. Sorry. Um, so that, that, that is the problem we have right now is the strain both on uh, our, our abilities to keep up with contact tracing and then our ability to keep our schools totally staffed. Now this doesn't spread, this is not, this is not an emergency at any, in any, in all of our schools, but it is trending on the edge of that in some of our schools. Um, we have multiple campuses that, and, and, and I'm not gonna be able to cite the, the numbers exactly because you saw what just happened, but um, I'm going to talk about Flagview for a second. Flagview, uh, if we go back to Thursday of last week, they had about seven or eight teacher absences and only two-ish subs that picked those up. So now Flagview is in a situation where they have to figure out how to cover five to six classrooms without a teacher. Now, in normal days, normal times, pre-COVID, a Friday when you got people out of the building, it is not uncommon to have one or two classrooms where that happens and you figure it out, you, you make it work, people step up. But this is an everyday thing. Uh, and the same thing happened to Flagview yesterday, the same thing happened to them today. They are having to figure out how to cover five or six classrooms. And I'll tell you how those classrooms get, get filled. An administrator will step in and cover the classroom all day. I should have left that one for last because it's probably not the first one that happens. Um, they will cancel library, they will cancel art, they will cancel music, they will cancel PE. They will cancel those things to pull a teacher to put in a classroom. And, and, and that's assuming that it's, you know, likewise, if maybe the PE teacher was out, they would just say, well, we're not doing PE today, right? So they, they take teachers from other places to try to fill those spots. Um, if, if that isn't enough, they might do something like, um, thanks, Josh. Uh, they might do something like we are going to, uh, so let's say there are 17 kids left in a class, which is probably a really, high in the sky kind of number because our classes are much bigger than that. But let's say there are 17 kids in our class. Uh, we're gonna take, uh, at Flagview, they, they, may, they might take three from this, this, those 17 kids and put three in there and three in there and three in there and three in there and three in there. And now you have a class that was already mostly full and you've just added a bunch more kids. Um, so we're not breaking any rules by doing that, but what we are doing is just putting stress on those teachers. And at some point, we has we as administrators and leaders have to decide, 
is do we need to close the school for the day or for two days or for three days or however long we have to if we cannot safely staff our building? Because in the end, that's what it has to boil down to. Um, is it safe to, to have a school with not enough adults to, to, to do what we're supposed to do? Um, supervision has to happen and other safety measures have to take place. So um, I, I, I talked about flag view a bunch. Um, we also are having the same issue. Um, Adobe is another one that is of extremely high concern right now. Um, Mountain View has had little blips of this. Northside has had blips of it. Uh, surprisingly, our outlying areas are doing pretty well. They, they've, they've got enough local subs that don't really have anywhere else to sub, right? Like, like they, that's where they sub. They sub there all the time and, and they're helping each other out a lot and they're doing a lot of great outreach to make that happen. Um, but some of, our, some of our schools right here in town are really, especially in Elko specifically, are having a hard time keeping enough staff in place. Elko High School has had some moments of this as well. Um, and that's just from COVID numbers. If, if we enter into a Friday where now coaches have to leave to take their kids somewhere, it, that, that's just going to add to it. So um, back. Um, I'll remember to bring my cord next time. What happened? <laughs> I don't need to give you that. I think I painted the picture. I, I think you got it. Um, the mess, and I'm going to reiterate the statement I said at the beginning. We are literally doing everything we possibly can to keep our, our schools open. Um, and I can't express enough gratitude to our teachers, administrators, paraprofessionals, nurses, secretaries, uh, substitutes Th thank you to the the community members who are subbing um if 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 you have the ability to substitute teach we sure can use you um at at our schools uh, they i told travis when i talked to him today i said i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about your situation he said okay i said you know maybe at, at worst or at best you know I, I convinced someone to take a flag view job um one of these days uh we really need to um we really need to get our, our, our schools with enough adults in that to keep it going. Um, now, for a, a positive uh, on that would be maybe, um, sorry, uh, when, when you look at the trends of Omicron across different parts of the country where, where it's kind of taken its toll already and it's starting to go down, the, the, the anticipated time frame is that um, about a four week situation, right? So we're, we're kind of in the middle of that, but we anticipate having, and we're planning, you know, preparing for the worst. We're, we're figuring this is gonna keep being a problem for the next three weeks, basically, get us to uh, Valentine's and maybe it'll go back by then. But um, uh, that, that's just the reality of our situation. And I wanna make sure everyone's aware of A, the reality, and B, that everyone is doing everything they can. Uh, and I feel pas I passionate question? about that, yes. About subs. Yeah. Do they ever do, um, it, meaning the state, an emergency um, waiving of requirements for a substitute in an emergency situation? Or is it, no, this is just the way we do it? Uh, short answer, yes. Um, do you want to say anything about that or? Yeah, just like what the process is and what challenges might exist still within that. All right. So right now, for us to in the Elko and on an emergency or emergency type basis in the rural, and to them right now it's. We continue to check with them substitutes but as of yet so an emergency to... doesn't count when you're going to shut down a school not shut down but you're going to close the campus and have to go to remote learning because you don't have staff and they don't consider that an emergency well they ought to um <laughs> that that is one of the things yeah before, before jeff jumps in there, <laughs> um by the way that I mentioned <laughs> petitions we're making to the state for certain changes to be made. That is one of those is that 
every school everywhere be able to every school district everywhere and that that includes washoe that includes clark like we're all in the mire with this um that we be granted those emergency uh sub processes the, the requirement. Yep. The, the requirement to receive your emergency substitute license in the state of nevada you only need to submit a high school diploma okay a standard substitute teaching license requires 60 credits for an associate's degree. So they have to figure out how to keep, you know, the, the two separate. If we just had a, a thousand emergency subs, what would benefit, what, why would someone go out of their way to get an associate's degree to apply for a substitute standard license, right? So that's their way of keeping things separated is the rural smaller areas. That's where you, it's an emergency type basis. That's where you'll get an emergency sub. And, and I mean, obviously, it's worth noting that even though we are an emergency and we do need people desperately, we still have to be cautious and judicious about who we're putting in our schools and in front of our kids. Um, otherwise, you're going to end up with a different kind of emergency if you're not careful. And so um, you know, those we still have to be very thoughtful about that. But yes, that to just answer that, yes, there is a process and we are trying to make it more widely um, is there, do you have a, like an approximate number? Because when people hear stuff like that, they're like, oh, I can't make it. I can't make a difference just myself. So I'm not even going to try. But do you like around? I mean, how many do you is is it, you know, like I can shut down my clinic for a day and come and sub? I mean, because I've done that before. Uh, or is it like, do you need like tens of people? Do you need uh, like hundreds of people? How about I just take I'm going to thank you. My, I finally have my <laughs> my numbers. I swear I came prepared, just not with a cord, darn it. Um, uh, I'm going to give you just a quick rundown of uh, of how many vacancies, uh, unfilled vacancies we had. And, and I am just talking about classroom teachers. This is not talk about secretaries. This is not talk about nurses. This is not talk about administrators. I am just talking teachers. Um, so on Thursday of last week, uh, Flagview was down five. Grammar was down two. That's seven. Uh, Matt, can you keep tally for me? Sure. All right. Uh, Liberty Peak was down two, Mountain View was down two, Northside was down three, uh, Spring Creek Elementary was down two, um, Adobe Middle School was down seven, Spring Creek Middle was down two, Elko High was down two and a half. Um, the half is kind of funny, but it just means someone works half time. Um, and that was all of them on Thursday of last week. What was that, Matt? 27 and a half? Yeah. Seven and a half. Yeah. 27 and a half. Monday, yesterday, um, Flagview was down six. Mountain View was down two. Northside was down one. Sage was down one. Southside was down two. Spring Creek Middle was down one. West Wendover was down one. Middle School was down one. Uh, Elko High School was down two. Spring Creek High was down one. Uh, Carlin High School was down two. And then Wells Elementary and Wells High School reached down one. What was that total? 21, 21. Okay, so in the 20s. Um, and then, you know, I, I think the point is clear. I can go through today as well if you'd like. But that, um, now, I, and again, I will say, and Keith will attest, having been a secondary principal himself and Candace having been an elementary principal herself, it, when you get one or two, it's not the end of the world. We're used to that. We figure it out. Um, but pre-COVID, those things would happen occasionally. A teacher would be like, yeah, I'll be willing to give up my prep for today. That's fine. Um, but what's happening is it's every day, every teacher is giving up their prep. Every day specials are being canceled. Every day this is happening. And so we can still make that work one or two at a school a day. But when you get Adobe down six or seven and flag you down four or five regularly, um, it's just, it's not, it's not good. Um, uh, they're making it work again. They're doing everything they can, but that's the reality right now. A quick question on that. What makes it an emergency? Because I was just double checking and we're under a state of emergency. That's why we're wearing these. Um, so there, there, there's a very specific application. Is it, I mean, who do, who makes that? The, the, uh, I think it's the, is it the, Department of Education that has, yeah, so there's a, there's an application for it in the Nevada Department of Education that they, they kind of just declared what, what, what would constitute the emergency and which places that that emergency could be 
that could you recall could be anything granted. of such as an example in the past where that may have happened? I, has that ever happened? I've only used it in, I mean, I've only been a principal and, and an administrator uh, in yeah. the COVID environment. So I've used it, I uh, used it in Wells last year um, uh, and it was helpful. Um, because but, of the, the heating situation. Yeah, but Wells, is, Wells is considered a... And once, if, if your school or your community is allowed to use emergency subs, like Wells, CJ, right. for example, he didn't wait till COVID to use his emergency subs. He used them in normal years. Right. Yeah. I'm just wondering why we can't do that in Elko too. And like, like CJ mentioned, that's that's what we are working on. Trying. Um, yeah. Trying to get permission. We, we don't have all those answers. Yeah. And it, every, literally, so, I can shoot you a link to the <laughs> declaration of emergency from the governor. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, 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 facetiously. Yeah. We, I, I got you, man. Uh, we are uh, every, unanimously the superintendents all agree that this is what we need. And and we have put a request forth for that uh, as recently as okay. a couple of days ago. So. so did I understand correctly that an associate's degree is what it takes to be a sub? Obviously, background checks, those type of yep. safety concerns, but anyone with an associate's degree can become a sub? Yes. Does not even have to be in the. And do we just show up at a school? Not we, but does someone just show up at a school and say, "Hi, here's my associate's degree. No. I can sub." Apply online through the Nevada Department of Education. What's that? How long does that process take? It takes about four weeks to receive your license after a background check. There's can have to do fingerprints and process that all through. Yeah, okay. there was there were a lot of efforts made by principals and the district at the beginning of the year to. Uh, I believe we published things in the newspaper and on websites and trying to get people to become substitutes. Um, and, you know, here we are. So as far as the background check goes, if it, so such for myself, right, going through the state, getting my state license, does that background check apply for this? Or do we have to get a whole nother one in that? Do they have to go through a whole nother background check? For substitute teaching license? I'm so sorry. To apply for a substitute teaching license? Yes. Yeah. Do they need a whole nother one then? They require a brand new background okay. check every time. You Second apply. question then. So in order to be a um, a chaperone, there was what was an act where we had to do the background checks in order to become a, 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 a chaperone through that. Can they use that background check that's been run through the through the school district to do that? No, they require their own. Just to give you an idea, Josh, of... The, the background check to become a teacher yeah. is different from the background check to become a sub. Like we, we go through different fingerprinting and, and background check processes. So it's, it is very different for each individualized situation. Our substitute teachers go through. Okay. I'll explain. So when, when a teacher um, applies for a license through the state of Nevada department of ed, they are asked to go and get electronic fingerprints taken, which are electronically submitted to the state. Okay, They'll, we usually say you can go to the sheriff's department or to A1 alcohol and drug collections. Okay, they take care of that. When someone wants to be a substitute teacher for the Elko County School District and say they were previously a sub custodian and they did fingerprinting with us, they are required to have electronic fingerprints done separately brand new fingerprints for the state of Nevada for their substitute teaching application. So this substitute teachers and certified teachers have get the same kind of fingerprinting for two different types of licenses. It has nothing to do with El the Elko County School District. We we don't license the Nevada Department of Ed does that. And no, I just didn't no. know if they'd allow it to no, nope. nope. I had the, I had a situation last year in Wells where a sub, uh, we were trying to get a substitute custodian. He recently had done a background check for something else, uh, handed me the fingerprint card from the sheriff's office, and I said, "Yeah, sorry, that that doesn't work. Um, it has to be this way." And um, yeah, doesn't make a, a whole lot of sense. And he does he didn't like it. In fact, he didn't like it so much he. Didn't want to do it. So um, we were out because of that. So, so barrier of entry is a little high too as well with this. So the what? The barrier of entry to do to yes. the substitute is a little. Yes. And and there the way the state puts it is anything can happen between now and the time you want to apply for a new license. So they will continue to ask for new background checks, new fingerprints every time you And I know it's not you, but I'll counter with um, 
you just I, we can perpetuate licenses for other people. I haven't done a, you know, I haven't done that in six years for my chiropractic license, but I have done a background otherwise. So, you know, we can propagate for one, but not for the other. So, but anyways. Can I ask, are we losing subs because of pay? They don't want to work during COVID times. Like why is our sub pool lowering, getting lower? I mean, that, uh, I'm not I guess, sure that's a question I can answer without doing some some more digging. Um, no, that's okay. I well, think those are things we need to look at for the future, of course. Um, just how can we uh, maintain a healthy sub pool uh, and look at what might be causing that after? I mean, hopefully we never have this kind of situation. Well, again, what I but. what I didn't tell you is how many subs we do have. Right, the subs that we did fill are more numerous than the ones that were not filled. If we had 26 unfilled, we we had probably twice that filled. Like very grateful to our subs. I am not calling out anyone. I'm saying we, we are experiencing a greater need for subs than we've ever experienced. It's not that our subs just don't wanna work anymore. I'm sure there are some effects of, well, if my kid's been contact traced and they're home, then I, I can't go sub, I'm there with my kid. Um, that's probably happening in some situations, but more than anything, it's just, there's a higher need for subs than there has been. And in my in my visits with the administrators and the, the schools, I think almost every administrator has indicated a long term sub issue within their schools. So I think that's also drawn the subs down because they're filling classes, T teacher vacancies teacher that didn't vacancies, get filled right. during hiring. And yep. so that's I mean that's probably in the in the at least two dozens. Yeah, so. the next yep, that that definitely contributes. There's lots of little factors. Yep. So. That's that's our state of things there. Um, uh, some positives for you, because I'm a cheery guy and I'm excited about fun things too. So um, I've already talked about how positive it is that our staff are doing everything they can. I'm really appreciative to them. I think they just deserve the most recognition. Um, uh, I, I've been able to attend a couple of different events over the last couple of weeks um, since we last met and uh, just want to give some kudos. Uh, the the Elko High School, Adobe Middle School, and Flagview uh, Strings and Orchestra students um, finally had a concert. Um, it was wonderful. Uh, great to see them out there. Uh, great job to Mr. Uh, Roderick Royce, the strings teacher who works with kids at all three of those schools. He has, I can only imagine his schedule, uh, having to bounce between three locations, but uh, all those kids have been working hard and they, they did a wonderful job. Um, also was able, as Matt mentioned, I was at the uh, Poetry Out Loud um, competition uh, at the, and both of these events I just mentioned were at the Performing Arts Center, which is a great place to be. Um, those kids did a wonderful job. Congratulations to them and uh, really, really just impressed by, by what our kids are capable of. Um, and then follow up to the spelling bee. Uh, I, I neglected to thank some people um, when I mentioned earlier what, how kids got to, to this point. Uh, I want to say thanks to Candace Brown, who uh, kind of spearheaded that whole situation. Um, and, and obviously to all the, the judges at every campus that helped the judges at the district spelling bee, the big, big thanks to the people who put themselves up there to read the words, because uh, that's, that's intimidating as well. Um, also, thanks to Spring Creek Middle School and people who stepped up at the last moment, Candace Brown um, found herself in a COVID exclusion situation and uh, pled for people to help her and the Spring Creek Middle School administration and, and staff and other people helped pitch in to make sure our kids didn't lose that opportunity. So just another example of what people are doing to still keep things open, still keep things going, keep our kids receiving opportunities. So uh, shout out to all them. Uh, Susan, you asked about where where the winners go. I'm no spelling be a rule book aficionado or anything, but my understanding is that the, the, the overall champion of the spelling bee, and then unless I'm mistaken, the individual grade winners qualified for the state spelling bee. And that takes place in Las Vegas in March 26th, maybe I want to say. Um, so they will have that they're eligible for it. They're, you know, we're not going to, Put them in cuffs and drive them down there or anything but if they want to participate in that then then they'll have that opportunity so uh, that's my understanding of where they go from here 
I was just thinking it was the main, like there were winners of grade levels and then there's an overall winner and the overall winner is the one that goes to Vegas. And you know, uh, that maybe, um, I just I, was trying to get I'm under a different right impression. Uh, I don't know, Candace, do you have any clue? Okay. I will, I'll verify for you. Um, I don't know the answer to that for sure though. Um, and yeah, great job to all our students and, and kids uh, and staff who made those things happen. So uh, that is the conclusion of probably the lengthiest superintendent report you've heard. May I please give you the NRS for the emergency sub um, so you can get to get a little more information on that. It's NRS 391.0896. Uh, That'll give you all the requirements for emergency substitutes if you want to read up on that. Thanks, Cassie. You also get a one. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> All right. We'll move on to item 6.01 approval of accounts payable. Mr. Chair, if I may, mm -hmm. I appreciate your indulgence. Uh, thank you very much. Julia, do you have anything you want to say before I ask my only two questions this time? Me? No. Okay. Whatever questions you have. Great. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, thank you. There is a, on the first page, is $68,900 expense to AirMed employee memberships. Are yeah. we, are we self-funded as insurance? We are. So the district self-funded, that means premiums go from the funds paying salaries into the insurance fund. And those are then used to pay for insurance claims, prescriptions and operating costs. And the district has like stop loss policies that reimburse if a certain individual's claims accumulate over a certain amount. Every few years they reevaluate that to see if that's still a good idea. But um, self-insured is typically lower cost because under an insurance plan, you'd still be covering claims and you'd also have admin costs and a profit margin to the insurance company. Um, I can go into more depth, but I don't know no, how I, much you need. No, that, <laughs> okay. the, the point of my question was, as a self-insured plan, $68,000 is a really expensive option to say, here you go, staff to have a you know a, a, an insurance policy is basically what that is knowing though that we're self-insured one flight is way more than this so considering that I, we're not larger than nevada gold mines but i think we're the second largest employer in the county um so knowing how many people we have the risk of that one flight is pretty substantial so um, I appreciate that. I just, when I saw that, I, I was like, whoa, that's Actually, a lot of money. And so I, I, I appreciate the prudence of, of getting that insurance to save the, the self-insured system. It's actually a very cheap benefit compared to about any other benefit we offer. It's only $50 per employee. It covers the employee and their households. It protects them against any out-of-pocket costs on an emergency flight, and those can easily be $75,000. Mm -hmm. And it does save the district money as well because it brings in um, our PPO plan that kind of argues our claims in our benefit. So. Okay, so rough calculation then at $50 a piece, that's 1,378 employees covered. I think yeah. the odds are are definitely in our favor that this is, is going to be... Uh, advantageous for us. So thank you. Second question that I had is for the three months or so that I've been on the board, I think every single payable expenditures has included a an expense to the special election. Yeah. What did what did we end up spending on that election? So I track that we've spent about 116,000 dollars on the special election and that includes everything from printed um, ballots that got mailed out postage supplies um, time 
for the county um, poll workers and the Dominion voting machine services. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions, Mr. Chair. How would the board like to proceed? I'll make a motion that we approve the accounts payable. I'll second it. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded to approve the accounts payable. Any more discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Chair votes aye and accounts payable passes. Moving on to the Wells Rural Electric accounts payable. Mr. Chair, vote to approve Wells Rural Electric as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the Wells Rural Electric accounts payable. Any discussion? Mr. Chair, I would just like to note that um, disclose that I have a family member who is employed by Wells Rural Electric, so I will be abstaining. Okay. No more discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? One abstention and the chair votes aye and the accounts, Wells Rural accounts payable passes. Moving on to item 7.01, another chance for input from the public. Thank you, members of the board. My name is Lee Hoffman. I was not planning on commenting tonight but there have been three things that I have noticed going through the discussion uh, that I wanna to try to tie together. This may seem a little odd. I wanna to tie together something about Mr. Anderson's superintendent's report, which by the way, thank you very much. That was a most informative discussion and the most informative report I have heard in the time I've been coming to these meetings. I want to tie that together with the items from the board discussion that Mr. McCarty went through and from item 2.02 .02 regarding your evaluation tool. And why do I tie those all together? It has to do with transparency and open meeting. First thing is that you were all up here talking about a document under item 2.02 .02 that was not available to the public. It wasn't on the, on the website. Now I understand that you will probably go into executive session when you actually do an evaluation, but it seems fair that the public would be able to see the tool you're using so that we understand what criteria you're gonna be evaluating Mr. Anderson on. So I guess I, I could pose that in the form of a question but at the moment you're not in the mode of answering questions to the public. <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate what Mr. McCarty had to say. His research is uh, thorough. I think it's entirely appropriate for the board to interact at least to a limited degree without deliberation on uh, coming to a decision if somebody stands up here and just says, well, can you please answer me a question? And it actually says in your policy that the president could answer a question or refer it to the superintendent or to staff to get back to the person instead of always just sitting there and not interacting. So that kind of brings me to that third point when it comes to your discussion of deliberation. I loved Mr. Anderson's report tonight. I loved the interaction with the board, but I don't understand how that interaction, since testing, possible school closures, and uh, the need for substitute teachers were not identified as topics that you were actually gonna discuss tonight, but there was lots of interaction but that interaction is healthy. I don't think that the intent of the open meeting law is to prevent that kind of interaction. And I think the same thing could be said for interacting with the public. I think you could make the argument that you were deliberating as easily as 
you can make the argument that you're deliberating with me. Now, uh, may I indulge the chair? May I ask the chair for indulgence for another 30 seconds? <clears throat> okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry, then I, then I lost my thought of what I was going to say. Uh, I, the only thing I was going to say is typically, if there is a violation of open meeting law, the penalty is limited to invalidation of an action taken by the board. Okay. So you're not at any great risk in that context. Thank you. <clears throat> to, because we're talking about evaluations and to answer that question, all the evaluations that I've been involved in have been done in open meeting. For the director, or for the, sorry, not the director, but for the superintendent. And thank you, because that, Mr. Hoffman, I will look into why some documents are on there and others aren't. Others, I'm some I know clearly why, because it's a, a privacy issue, but this is something that, that I had intended to ask previously and I failed to do so. So thank you for bringing it up so that I can, I can inquire as to why some are and some aren't. No more public comment. Moving on to item 8.01. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.